Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. And hey, we're starting a brand new series. Look at your neighbor and say, you picked a great week to come to church. Just go ahead. Maybe back to the other neighbor you didn't want to have to talk to. Brand new series called More Today. Because we have this insatiable desire, don't we? Let's just be honest. To have more. It's a constant struggle with all of us to have more. And if we were to talk about any of the topics that we could possibly talk about in church, uh, this concept of more specifically as it relates to the next word is really important. In fact, if I were to say, hey, what, what did I get right with my kids? Where did I go right with my kids? I made sure that my kids knew this specific topic. I made sure that if I was going to talk about more of something, it was going to be this one. And it's the concept, it's the topic of economics. Money, 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 right? More and more money. Does anybody know that the economy is going crazy right now? Can I get an amen? Right, That's a hearty amen. You're like, man, I I need to stop looking at the stock values of things because I don't even know. One day I'm really excited. The next day I'm like, "Ah, the end better come. Jesus better come because I'm in trouble. How many people know what I'm talking about, right? Inflation is at a rate that we have never seen in many of our lifetimes. So we're going to talk about economics and specifically about money. And we're going to talk about money in a way that's helpful today. Right? We're going to talk about maybe what I would call the four fundamental questions of the economy. We're going to talk about the four fundamental questions. There, there's literally thousands of questions out there that we could talk about with economics, but these are the four fundamental questions that stand out above the rest. Again, if I were to tell you, like, where did I do right with my kids? It's these four questions. In fact, I think if you'll get these four questions right, I don't want to overpromise here, but I have never seen someone get these four questions right and not do well in life. These four questions will impact, affect, affect everything in your life. In fact, I would even go so far as to say you will have less financial storms in your life if you can get these four questions right. I would even say, go so far as to say that I think God would elevate these four questions amongst everything. And so we're going to look at four questions over the next four weeks, and and here they are, just so you know where we're going, is uh, today we're going to talk about how you work, next week how you honor, the third week how you budget, and the fourth week how you Sabbath. And I I think if we could get these four right, again, we have a firm foundation under which to live our lives. We've all watched, like I said, Wall Street go on some kind of roller coaster ride this past year. How is it that you should respond? Well, I can tell you if you get the how to work and how to honor and how to budget and how to Sabbath questions right, if you do them right, you're going to end up with a much higher success rate in life. And as the famous theologian Larry the Cable Guy would tell you, We just need to get her done, right? We just need to get this one done. We need to dig down deep, pick ourselves up by our bootstraps, and do some hard work. Now, some people are in the room. One, you're freaking out because you're like, the pastor is talking about money. Let me just go out on a limb and tell you we don't need your money. That's not why I'm doing a series on money. The church is in great financial situation right now. That is not the point of this series. The point of this series is that we, as the people of God, would honor God with our money. And you might think, like, well, pastor, you need to stay in your lane. You need to stay in the ethics lane. You need to stay in the spiritual faith prayer lane. You really don't have any business talking about money. Well, au contraire, mon frère. Do you know that the Bible, if you were to tell me, like, you should just preach what the Bible preaches. The Bible speaks about money, economy, work, Sabbath, honor, budget, Four times more than it does about faith and prayer combined. So if I want to just stay in my lane and stay in the Bible, I need to four times more than the other things talk to you about the economy and about money. So today, like I said, we're going to talk about this first one. How should we work? How should we work? Now I've got children, one's in high school, one's in college, and one is out in the real world. And praise God, she even pays for, you know how your children are on their own nowadays? Used to be they would move out. You know how you know now? 
Somebody already said it. They pay for their own cell phone. Amen. Preach it. Thank you, Brittany. She's got that covered. Working on Zach. That'll be next year. Like, hey, buddy, it's time to adult. Adulting is hard. It's time for you to pay for your own cell phone, right? But I just want to say up front, a lot of us with this concept of money and specifically about work, as we look at the younger generations, we'll say something like this. They don't know how to to work, right? They don't don't know how to work. They don't know how to put in an honest day's work. Well, Well, part of that is our fault as parents and families. We didn't know how to parent, and so we have what we created or we allowed, right? We created these children, and we've allowed them to not work. And so one of the things that I would encourage you is not look at a generation and make a judgmental statement like that, but instead, what is it that I did? I'm ridiculously in charge of me. I'm ridiculously in charge of my actions, my reactions. And so as we watch this, this sermon isn't for the generation that doesn't know how to work. This sermon is for us as people, is how could we work better? Because quite honestly, as I stand in front of you today, I want you to know most of us are deceived when it comes to money. Most of us live a life where where we're doing the best we know how to do, But we're doing things that ultimately, quite honestly, are killing us financially. Each one of us sitting in the chairs. This sermon, again, is not for someone down the row from you. It's not for your grandchild. It's for you. It's for me. Because we've been taught that there's this thing about more, that there's gain. And I should just ultimately be about gain. And that gain is going to bring me life. And that life is going to get me more. I'm going to have more. But what if, what if... What we are doing with our lives in the constant pursuit of more is actually bringing us death. What if the way we deal with economics, the concept of work and Sabbath and budgeting, and the way we honor God, what if we are being deceived? Self-deception was the experience of Ignaz Semmelweis. You guys, he's a famous uh, OBGYN. You've never heard of him. But he was all the way over in the Vienna General Hospital in Europe during the mid-1800s. It was a prestigious uh, research hospital as well as a place where children would be born into the world. And it's not like it is here in America where there's four or five choices of where to get medical service, different doctors. You got what you got, right? You get what you get. You don't pitch a fit. And so uh, Dr. Semmelweis was delivering babies, but he was also doing research in the hospital. And you don't do research on living things, you do research on dead bodies. Yeah, so the cadavers are here in this side of the hospital, and and the ladies that are giving birth are on this side of the hospital. And and so Dr. Semmelweis, in his uh, great medical practice doing all the research and delivering babies, it was said that women were dying, one out of every ten would die when they came to give birth at his hospital. How many people know that's not good? That's, those are not good rates, right? Dr. Semmelweis went away on a, a trip. He was off on sabbatical. And while he was gone for three months, the mortality rate in, in the, the, where the babies were born went down exponentially. So when he came back, people were saying, um, Dr. Semmelweis, something is not wrong. You, you are supposed to be bringing life into the hospital, but you are bringing death. And so Dr. Semmelweis's research, they would go back and forth between the cadavers and the live bodies. And this is before people knew about cooties, right? They didn't know about germs. They didn't know that if I worked on dead bodies that I would bring germs from dead bodies into the place where life was supposed to come into the room. And so in this research, what they, they realized is, is maybe just maybe what's happening over there with death is being infected in where it should be bringing life. And so Dr. Semmelweis came up with this idea. He said, what if we were to wash our hands? How many people have learned to wash their hands in COVID, right? (laughs) Do you ever hear the thing like, you should wash your hands for sing happy birthday twice? You ever hear that? That's from Dr. Dr. Semmelweis. He's the one that came up with that. He said, you should wash your hands in chlorine and lime right? I know we don't do that. We have soap, thank God. Uh, but we're, we're in there washing our hands now because of this experience. Here's a doctor who has made a promise to humanity that I will bring life into every situation. But Dr. Semmelweis was showing us through it all that even though he thought he was bringing life, what he was ultimately doing was bringing death. And so he made a boundary. He drew a line in the sand That said, if you are going to work on the cadavers, you must then wash your hands. And I wonder how many of us need a line in the sand 
a line, a fence, a boundary that might just maybe be from God that would bring life where we have injected death. Dr. Semmelweis actually said this. He said, God only knows how many patients prematurely went to the grave because of me. That's tough to live with. A doctor was supposed to be the source of life was bringing death. But then he gets this simple guideline, a boundary, a fence that's helpful to bring life. Today we're going to jump into the oft-read book of Leviticus. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus is usually about on the uh, one-year Bible plan where people in their Bibles, they get to Leviticus and they bail, right? They're like, I don't know how to read this. But here's the reality about Leviticus. Leviticus is so helpful to bring the depth, the width, the length of God's amazing holiness and his great love and peace and grace that he shows towards us. So if you don't own a Bible, we've got a stack of them back at the connection desk. We would love to give you a Bible. You don't have to give us anything in return. Just stop by and say, can I get one of those Bibles? We also have an app on your phone so you can text the word Bible to 719-223-3996. And there's an, a great app, used it myself this morning, called Version that will get you there. Leviticus Chapter 18 is where we're going to start. All of the verses that we're going to use are there in your handout that you got on the way in, and I'm going to put them up here on the screen as well. But Leviticus gives us a clear understanding of boundaries. God gives us lines in the sand. He gives us fences, if you will, that are intended to give us life. Just like Dr. Semmelweis got to a point where he drew a line in the sand and said, on this side is death, this side is life. Leviticus does that in so many ways. It shows us a dietary law, and people might read that and be like, why am I not allowed to eat lobster? Thank God that doesn't apply anymore, right? Like, why can I not eat lobster? Why can't I eat pork? And the reason why is because of the condition of those foods. God was saving them and bringing them life if they would stay inside the boundaries. He brings relational law that did not exist. It was a barbaric society and culture back then. And God said it should not, ought not be that way. And Leviticus starts to bring relational law. He brings ceremonial and sacrificial law to show them how great he is, how holy and perfect he is, and how we can worship God. Leviticus lays out the ethics that are the building blocks of our American culture today. But I also want to show you Leviticus actually lays out the economic cycle that God intended, the economic law, if you will, that would bring us favor. God draws a line in the sand and basically says, guys, if you will stay inside the playground, you'll have favor, you'll have life. If you decide to play outside of my playground, you are on your own. It's almost like God is showing us how to wash our hands financially. So we're going to jump into Leviticus. It's it's there in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. First book of the Bible is Genesis, right? Genesis, God is the creator. He's taking from nothing and making something. He takes from the um, emptiness of the universe and he lays the stars and the planets and all of life here on planet earth. He puts it into order. And so God is on display and he makes us as humans, humans in his image. We go on then to the book of Exodus where God takes his people who are caught in slavery and he removes them from slavery. And and he shows to everybody, I'm the ruler. So not only am I the creator, but I'm the ruler. I'm going to show you guys how you should live. In the book of Exodus in chapter 20, we get the Ten Commandments. And this is the foundation of our faith, the Judaic faith. And then Judaic Christianity is based on these first books of the Bible. But in our sin, we destroy God's design. In our sin, we walk away from God, and God continuously brings us back. And so in the book of Leviticus, he's he's showing us this is how to stay in bounds. Here's the contract that I have with you, the covenant that I have for you. It's almost as if he's telling us in the Old Testament what he would eventually tell us in the New Testament. I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Now stay in the boundaries. It's the equivalent of God just saying, you you don't have to pay the stupid tax on life. Just do it my way. If you play by God's rules, he will bring life. 
If you dismiss God's rules, you will bring death. So Leviticus is not so much, don't do this, you have to do this. Leviticus is, here's where I will be, God is telling you. Here is where my favor will lie, God is showing you. Just stay in bounds. So Leviticus chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, it says this, the Lord spoke to Moses. Moses, the uh, leader of the nation of Israel at this point, the, the man who God had used to bring the nation of Israel out of slavery, saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt. Egypt is polytheistic. They have many gods where you used to live, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan. They're atheists. They have no gods to which I am bringing you. So basically, God's telling them, don't be polytheistic to made-up gods. Don't live atheistically. Live monotheistically, because I am your God, and I have a plan. He goes on there, he says, you shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules, keep my statutes, and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. God is telling them, I am in charge. There's one God, one God with one plan. And we could pretend like he's not God. We could pretend like he's not in charge and doesn't have a plan. But God is still telling us that today. Guys, I got this. And maybe someone needs to hear that this morning. Life's running out of control, isn't it? Maybe it's a sale of a house or a not sale of a house. Maybe it's a job or a loss of a job. Maybe it's a relational struggle or a horrific report from the doctor. I don't know. But I need you to hear this. God, our God, is one God, and he's got a plan. And that plan is for you to prosper. That plan is for you to have life. But sometimes we live deceived that we have a better plan than God. So God goes on to Luke chapter, or not Luke, excuse me, Leviticus 19. So just one more chapter up there in the beginning. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for the Lord your God is holy. He is holy. God's saying, I'm in charge. I call the shots. I have a way of doing things because I'm king. I'm ruler. This is not a democracy. This is a theocracy. You are my subjects and I am the king. I'm the ruler. He would change that in the New Testament to say, I'm the father and you are my children. You are adopted into my family. It's almost like this fence here. It's almost like God gives us a fence in the book of Leviticus, right? It's almost like God says to us, he's like, I'm going to give you the boundaries. I'm going to draw the lines for you to live. That if you will stay in the fence, if you'll stay in the boundaries, there will be life. If you choose... To ignore the boundaries, there will be death. If you will come into the fence and live the way the book of Proverbs would show us, the nation of Israel and all of their iterations would show us, if you'll live here, there will be feasting. And when you decide that the boundary is negligible and I'm in charge, God, I'm the ruler, then there will be famine. It's almost like God is telling us over here, I will bring favor. And I'm not talking, oh, I am so sorry about the people that take this point and they beat it home to say, hey, if you just stay in the fence, then everything will prosper in your life and you'll get rich, right? Just give the church $1,000 and see if God won't give you $10,000. That's nonsense. But over and over and over again, God says, guys, I have made a way. I have a way of life of living just like the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, it will tend to happen that you will find favor on this side of the fence. And God is going to allow you to go through very difficult seasons. It not only makes you stronger, but it makes your faith stronger. But on the, this side of the fence of favor, God says there is a way for you to live where there's blessings, not cursings. The book after Leviticus, we, we find a book called Numbers. Numbers is when the nation of Israel decides this. They decide, well, this is a really nice fence, right? This was custom built just for us today, right? It was really rich. Thanks for this fence. It's a great fence. Um, 
But the nation of Israel would come along and say, you know what? Um, in the book of Numbers, they would say, well, I don't really like this fence, though. Mm, this fence is constricting. This fence is keeping from me from living. I want to live. I want to live like never before. I live my best life now, right? Like this fence, I don't like this fence. And so in the book of Numbers, the nation of Israel just keeps saying, uh, uh, this fence, um, we'll do without this fence. And they begin a cycle where they begin to walk away from God. And God reveals himself, shows them their unfaithfulness, their unrighteousness. And the nation of Israel begins to crumble apart and fall, and God restores them, saves them, puts them back on the right side of the fence. We go from the book of Numbers over to the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy, I don't even know if you know this, but it literally means to reestablish or repeat the law. In the book of Deuteronomy, we see God reestablishing the fence because God has fences for our well-being. In fact, you can write this down in your notes. God wants us to live inside the fence of favor. And if you're only going to pay attention for 20 seconds online, put the pancakes down for a second, look right there. God wants us to live inside the fence of favor. God created you to be with him in the playground, inside the fence where his favor rests, because over here is life, and out here when we disregard it is death. In here is feasting, and outside of it is famine. Think about it. Along, guy, along comes a guy in the Old Testament. His name's Joshua. He leads the nation of Israel back inside the fence where they find favor. The book of Joshua is just, just piled up with God showing his favor in prosperity to the nation of Israel. The Jewish nation is a fascinating example of a nation that continuously bounces from inside where favor is to outside where famine is. So you get back to Leviticus, and as we jump into Leviticus 19 and we start to dive into those verses, you're going to see how, write this one down if you're taking notes, God has established an economic cycle, and it's hidden right there in plain sight for you in Leviticus 19. God gives us how to do work, how to do business, how to chase and build and obtain this concept of more. And God is telling you today, and he's telling me today, he's telling everyone that is listening, I am a God with rules, I am a God that has a cycle and a law over the economy that I have placed into motion. He's saying, I'm the God, I'm the author of finance, I'm the God, the author of your money. And most people, again, think God should just stay in your lane, God, Tell us like spiritual, relational things, but stick away from my money. And if you're offended again today, I'm sorry, but you picked a great Sunday to come to church. <laughs> Leviticus 19, over there in verse 23, when you come into the land, so, so God has promised them a land that they would go to, a, a land of, check this out, a flowing of milk and honey, a land of favor. When you get into the land, here's how you should live. Plant any kind of tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you, it must not be eaten. And in the fourth year, check this out, all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you. I am the Lord your God. And it's all right there. There's the guidelines to live by with your faith. God's take, he's not taking something from you. He's showing you how to get more. God's not taking from me. He's giving me more. God is clearly saying, I have more for you. Life is designed for you to find increase. How can I find and get more? Well, God has it right there in those few verses. God says, wash your hands, stay in the boundary. He's not trying to tell you, don't do this, you have to do this. When the world around you is dying because of financial unhealth, why in the world do we keep living the way of the world? So God has an economic cycle, and here it is. It's right there in those few verses. Write this first one down. So, 
You heard him say, when you go into the land, plant the trees. When you get into the land, do the work. The foundation of everything in your life means you start with a season of sowing. The next one is grow. First thing you do is you sow and then you watch it grow. But growing is going to require patience, isn't it? How many people in the room love patience? Don't pray for patience because God will develop that in you. But we sow and then we grow and then we harvest. We sow and then we grow and then we harvest. And for those of you who don't grow anything and you don't sow any plants and you're not in the agriculture business, this still applies to your life. We still have to go through seasons where we first sow and then we grow and then we find the harvest. And you can write these down, some quick points there. We sow by plowing and planting. You got to get the ground in a suitable state that you can actually put something into the ground. I'm going to tell a funny story and honey, uh, you'll just have to have this one. So we owned our very first house. It was on three acres. It was the original farmhouse estate of the entire uh, thing. They sold off the lots around it, but we had this huge three acre backyard. And one day I woke up to my wife, um, out in the backyard, and I was like, well, what are you, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm going to build a garden. I said, well, this is going to be awesome. We'll have, some, we'll have some food in the garden in the backyard. And the reason that I had even gotten attention in the backyard is because I looked out the bedroom window to my wife on the back of a tiller that was not in the ground, but instead was acting as like an ATV going across the backyard, dragging her as she went flying across the backyard. I was like, what are we doing? The great part of the story, though, is the farmer, same farmer who would every Friday bring us a brown paper bag of uh, produce from his farm, his actual farm, uh, and that many times was all the food we had to eat in those days. Uh, He saw her getting towed across by the tiller, and he brought his tractor down and said, where would you like your your beds? Because he he brought the tractor, and he just dug right in and drug across. And Trisha planted us carrots. She planted us potatoes. I don't know what else she planted because it didn't grow. Um... It's true. It's true. It's true. But but because the farmer was there to plow, she was able to plant. And let me just tell you, without that tractor, it would have been some hard work. It would have been some miserably hard work. And so if you look in Leviticus, it says, plant fruit trees. Plant trees that will bear fruit for you to eat. But this is going to be hard work. How many people know in every area of life, if you intend to see a harvest, you're going to have to do some hard work. You're going to have to plow and you're going to have to plant. Second thing, you can write this down. We grow by weeding and waiting. Did you hear him as he he said, as you go into the land and you plow the ground and plant, now you're going to have to wait. Don't go picking fruit from the tree. We used to live in Northern California. It was a beautiful oasis in our backyard. We had a pool and we had every kind of fruit tree you could think of. Oranges, tangerines. We had one thing that we thought was grapefruit, but it was some obscure varietal of whatever. We never ate it because it was gross. The, the skin on the outside was like a, almost an inch thick. It was just gross. But over on the right one, man, oh man, one day, one day that lime tree is going to bear fruit. Never bared any fruit. It was, you know how key limes are small, little tiny ones? This was small. This was like blueberry sized limes, right? <laughs> Not useful. But you can't, because of the way trees work, you can't harvest in those first days. Because the roots haven't gone down deep enough for the branches to be strong enough to hold the fruit that you want. But so many of us, we want to skip over sowing the hard work or we want to skip over the growing where we have to weed and wait. We just want to get to harvest. We just want to get moving. Let's go. But the economic cycle that God has put into place, he's saying if you'll do this plan, if you'll let things develop and mature and grow, you get to that fourth year. And the fourth year, unfortunately, is the one most of us skip. We harvest first for God. If you look in Luke 9, or Leviticus 19, it actually says in the fourth year, that harvest belongs to God. 
It actually is affirming and reaffirming a principle that starts in Genesis and goes all the way to Revelation where we bring our first and our best to God and we trust him with the rest. God gets the first and best because we're agreeing with him. You, in fact, are God. This is your tree. This is your land. You created it all. You made the rules. You put the stars in the sky. And if I ever want to live in the fence of favor... I'm going to have to sow, and I'm going to have to do some hard work, aren't I? I'm going to have to plow, and I'm going to have to plant. Then I'm going to have to watch things grow. I'm going to have to weed, and I'm going to have to wait. But the hardest part of living inside of the fence of favor, statistics would prove this to be true. Half of the people that attend our church give nothing to God financially. About a third of us give something substantial. And the rest give in some kind of passing fancy. And what we're saying to God is, I I know that you have declared the fence of favor. We're going to get into this one next week, so don't skip church. But just like in the book of Numbers, we're like, you know what? I don't like that fence. But then we're real quick to turn around, look God in the face and say, where where are you? This is true in every area of life, guys. It's not just money. Think about kids. So grow And harvest, right? If you've got an elementary school kid at home or maybe you have a grandkid at home, uh, we are sowing into those kids. That's a lot of hard work. Anybody with a young child in the house, let me just praise you for a second. Keep showing up. Stay in the game. I know it's hard work, but it is so worth it. Keep plowing. Keep planting. I know it's hard. Be intentional. Be intentional. Go back into parenting mode. Don't check out. It's worth it. It's hard. I know it. But you're sowing in that point, right? In that teen, in those teen years, in the 20-somethings, we, we got to be patient. We got to let them grow. We got to let them breathe. We got to send them out. In, in the 20s, you are weeding and waiting. When you get into your 30s, you want the harvest, but it's not time for the harvest. Anybody who's 50 and over, you know this to be true. 20s and 30s, you are going through a period where you're growing. You're weeding and you're waiting. You're continuously showing up. You're doing the right thing over and over again. And you get to a place when you get into your late 40s and 50s where you truly get into a season where you reap a harvest. And so for if you're a 20-something in the room listening or maybe you're following along out online, Uh, Your next step is to leave your mom and dad's house, right? (laughs) Parents, you can write the check to Brett Krimmel. (laughs) No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. But we all, we all are constantly in this cycle, this economic cycle. So grow harvest. And we have to take part of the harvest, put it back in the ground so that we can see it keep going. But here's the kicker. Most of us, we deplete the harvest by consuming the harvest And we don't put it back in and sow some more. God's created this economic cycle for us on how to work. You sow, then you watch it grow, and then you reap a harvest, right? And you can write this last one down. We harvest by reaping a reward. There comes a time in life, if you will follow God's economic cycle, that you reap a reward. And that reward is not always financial, That reward is not always something that ends up in your stock portfolio. That reward is from God because he designed you, created you. He knows exactly what you need. In fact, we we are at risk all the time of violating God's economic cycle just by the way we work. Because we fall in love with the concept of harvest. How many people love a good harvest? The rest of you are liars, right? Like... We love harvest. We love harvest season. We want to enjoy the harvest. We want to consume the harvest. We are consumed by being consumers of consumption and the harvest. In fact, here's the modern American economic cycle. Tell me I'm not telling the truth. (laughs) We love it. Harvest, harvest, harvest. Every day we should be a harvest. When I wake up, I should just get more and more and more. I just want harvest. Let's go, baby. Harvest, harvest, harvest. 
we want to skip over plowing. I don't even want to plant because that means I've got to carry heavy trees. I fly right past weeding and waiting because growing is boring. I just want to reap that reward. And here is what has happened. We have raised a nation of people that believe the American dream is harvest, harvest, harvest. And when you live that way for generations, you end up owing more than you make. And you are bankrupt. And we bankrupt the future of our children and our grandchildren. Sound familiar? Our God will not be mocked. There is an economic cycle that he has created. It means that we live inside the fence. And when we live inside the fence of favor, we first do the hard work. We sow. We plow. And we plant. And it means you're going to smell funny at the end of the day. You're going to sleep really well. That means we wait in the seasons of growing. We, we wait. We don't take the first fruits because that's going to hurt our harvest in the future. In fact, that first fruit inside the fence of favor belongs to God. And then we harvest. And when we live the way God intended, the economic cycle of sowing and growing and then the harvest, we live inside the fence of favor. But people cheat the economic process. Look, this is a New Testament concept because so many people, when you do a money series, they start talking about like, oh, this is all Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us. Great. This one is New Testament, season of grace, right? Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, harvest, 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 and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we sow and grow and harvest. Because we were not idle when we were with you. We sowed and we growed <laughs> and we harvested. Nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, sowing and growing, we worked right night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It's the economic cycle. Sowing and growing and waiting. Paul's basically saying there's an economic cycle of things and this applies to you and it applies to me. It's written during the early church after Jesus has ascended back to heaven. This is for us. Paul, Paul talks to the church in Ephesus and he says this, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Can you hear the economic cycle? Uh, students, if you're listening right now, students, you, you might think I'm going to get ahead by cheating on a test or, or quickly just copying from a neighbor something because you don't want to sew. Let me tell you, if you won't sew in the time you're in school, you're not going to grow a harvest worth having when you get my age. you got to put in the hard work. We all have to put the hard work in. You cannot cheat the process because our God will not be marked. And the tension for so many of us in the room yeah, yeah, pastor, you shouldn't steal. Why are we talking about stealing? We're talking about working. Because there in verse 24, it is as clear as day. It is hard for me as a pastor because of what other pastors have done to help you in this area. Because you think, oh, he's only doing this because he needs my money. I don't need your money. If you don't want to give your money to our church, find a church that you can give your money to and go there. That's not what this is about. I watch people come in fighting. You know what I'm going to do when marriages come in fighting? I'm going to lean in and I'm going to say, guys, you ought not fight. Let's figure out how not to fight. When I watch people stop coming to church for three months, I'm going to reach out to them and be like, man, where have you been? What's going on? Because your behavior doesn't line up with the faith that you said. Remember early on, God said, don't be polytheistic, but don't be atheistic. Live monotheistic that you actually believe there's a God. So we pray and we talk and we think like there's a God, but with our money we think we can mock God by saying this fence does not exist in finances. Let the thief no longer steal. How do we steal? Here it is. And in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be, what's that word right there say? Holy. You know what the word holy means? Someone help me. Set apart. The very first best you have should be set apart for God. Why? 
because it's an offering of praise to the Lord. It's saying, God, I acknowledge that you have an economic cycle. You've put this all together. My first and best comes to you. I'm going to trust you with the rest. But people come up with all kinds of rationalizations at this point of why they won't give God their first and best. God, God is even today giving us an amazing opportunity. I, I look at the tithe. Trish and I tithe. It's automatic. We do it online. But I look at the tithe as God, even in 2022, reminding us that he's in charge. He's given us a gift of the tithe. You know what I didn't do this morning? I didn't wake up and be like, God, would you please provide me coffee? You know why? Because I have a coffee bean grinder and a coffee maker. And I set it up last night. And I pushed a button. And you know what happened this morning? Ring! There's coffee. I, I went down because my car was on the E, right? And it said I had no gas. So you know what I did? I took a plastic thing out of my wallet, shoved it in a machine, and gas just ring! Showed up in my car. I didn't have to be like, God, would you please provide gas for my car today? But when I tithe, which I do, I'm saying to God, I trust you with everything. When I give him my first and my best, not what's left over at the end, when I give him the first and the best, it's a gift from God in a culture that we don't even need a God anymore. To go, man, God, I, I praise you. You are so good to me. I'm not just using my prayers and my words, but I'm actually putting my money where my mouth is and saying to God, you are God. Because we buy into this harvest, harvest, harvest delusion, you will lie to the people around you. You will lie to yourself because you just need to get ahead. What does it mean to believe in God? In Genesis, he's the creator. He created heavens and earth. He created us with all of the earth to be at our disposal. What does it mean to have a God of the book of Exodus where he's ruler and he's the redeemer? He pulls his nation out of slavery and begins to build a new people. He gives us fences of favor that we will live inside of where there will be favor, not famine. There will be life, not death. It means we acknowledge that God is a God over my work. He's a God over my Sabbath. He's a God over my money, my finances, my budget. It means I look at my ability to work. I look at the income that he has given me to steward as a gift from him. Money is not my God. God is my God. I can enjoy the money that God has given me, whether it be little or much, and be content. But I would bet none of us in the room would have made it this long listening to this talk if you didn't believe that there was a God. I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. Everybody pays attention in these moments. <laughs> when you position yourself inside the fence of favor, when you position yourself inside of the boundaries, the lines and the sands, when you say to God, you know what, you are my God and I will live my life the way you have told me, regardless if it makes any sense. When I position myself back here, do you know what God's disposed, his disposition towards me is? It's love. And don't you know that the Heavenly Father desires good things for his children? But when I decide to live outside of the favor of God, God is helpless in your life because he cannot reward disobedience. God cannot bless those who curse him. Now, now you might hear that and be like, what? You just said that the God who could do anything can't do something. <laughs> Our God will not be mocked. And he has clearly showed us, whether it be in the book of Leviticus or like we'll see all throughout the New Testament, that there is a plan, there's an economic plan that he has. And that economic plan is to put you inside the fence of favor. The question is, will we listen? 
Would you close your eyes and bow your head for just a moment? A number of us, I know, you hear this, um, and you immediately know um, that you have willingly made a choice to disregard the fence of God's economic cycle. In, in one of those ways, you heard me talking about sowing, and maybe you're realizing right now, um, you've, you've become kind of like those people Paul was talking about, where, where you're just not working. You don't like to plow, you don't like to plant. And maybe the Holy Spirit is telling you right now, that today could be a new day. It could be the beginning of a new season, where we get out and we, we do an honest day's work of plowing and planting, even if we don't want to but that we would lean into that space. Maybe for some of us, it's that season of waiting where we have to watch things grow and we've been pulling from the harvest, pulling from savings or retirement because we don't want to wait. Maybe God's just telling you it's still time to wait. It's just time to wait right now. Instead of uh, pulling from the savings, why don't we pull the weeds that are starting to grow? Maybe for some of us, it, it's that idea of the first harvest, the first and the best. We do not give to God our first and best. We give him whatever's left over, and most of the time, that's nothing. And maybe today, it's just the time to say this. God, I trust you, not just with my words, not just with my prayers, but I trust you with my finances. God, these are holy things, and I need to repent. I need to turn from my ways, turn towards your ways, and give you my first and my best. Father, I don't know how that works out. It doesn't look like spreadsheets work, but God, I'm learning to wash my hands today with finances. Would you help me to not bring death where I thought I was bringing life? God, would you help me in my life to cleanse myself of the thinking that leads to, I am in charge, I can provide, I can do enough. And God, I just pray that we would be faithful people. That God, as we pursue more, we'd find it inside the fence of favor. Where God, you have called us to live holy, set apart for you. On display that Jesus Christ, through your people, would be on display in the way that we honor you with our sowing and our growing and then reaping a harvest. Jesus, we love you for all that you do in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.